he touches an object belonging to a victim of a crime. He claims that suddenly he is transported beyond time and space. A crime is reenacted before his eyes. He says he's reliving a moment in the past, in a place he's never seen before, with people he does not know. It has been a trance, but when it ends, psychic Peter Herko seems to have hard information. The name of the killer, the manner in which the victim died, and the time of death. One, two, three. Uh, there were uh, actually in, uh, three people involved. Three people. He calls himself a psychic detective. Can ESP be used to fight crime and locate missing persons? In Search Of explores the potential of the psychic detective. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Chief Detective Robert Lowry has been with the Florissant Police Department in St. Louis for 23 years. For Lowry and detectives like him, the routine of casework follows the long-established techniques of following leads, gathering evidence, and questioning witnesses. Two years ago, Bob Lowry broke with tradition in his effort to solve a kidnap case. The manager of a local store was reported missing, and after three weeks of investigation, Lowry could find no reason for his disappearance and no clues to his whereabouts. He was persuaded to try a new and strikingly unconventional investigative tool. We conducted a very extensive investigation. We exhausted all these, and it was brought to my attention by a member of the television news media that we could possibly call in a psychic my reaction to it at first, of course, is that I'm a police officer, and police officers deal with fact, and I wasn't uh, too receptive to this idea. But I agreed to it after the family members indicated their desire. The results were remarkable. The psychic accurately pinpointed the location of the victim and led the police to the site. This information, relayed by psychic means, enabled the police to solve the case. Extrasensory perception is the power of the mind to reach across time and space in a way that seems impossible. To know a thought when it has not been spoken. To see an event that has happened in a distant place. Scientists acknowledge that it exists, but don't understand how it works. Some believe it can be harnessed for practical use, and one way may be in the fight against crime. There are psychic detectives all over the country. The most well-known is Peter Herkos, based in Los Angeles. Herkos first visits the scene of a crime to get what he calls psychic impressions. He handles personal possessions in an attempt to identify with the victim. Pictures of the crime take shape in his mind. To date, he has worked on over 800 criminal cases. In Chicago, psychic Irene Hughes has received commendations from police for her efforts in helping them solve no less than 15 murder cases. In St. Louis, Bevy Yeagers is earning a reputation as a psychic detective. Okay, 
Okay, we're going to be working on the, on the from that case again tonight, and there are a couple of you here who haven't really done too much on this. I'm going to try to fill you in just a little bit. We have gotten into this case uh, May the 25th, I think is the day that we were called in on it, and we were working on Bevy it. is a housewife and mother of six. Her attitude about ESP is unique in that she believes everybody has the potential for it. The astrology department seems to feel that uh, there was a plot involving... Six years ago, she founded a psychic rescue squad for the purpose of locating missing persons. Members of the squad hold down normal nine-to-five jobs and meet in the evenings for casework. They have proved themselves so effective that they have qualified as licensed private detectives. A, chance to work on it yet. a private detective agency is in itself kind of um, mysterious to the public, I suppose, and a private detective agency composed of psychics would be doubly so or more. We've had quite a job to do, as a matter of fact, in, in getting uh, people to understand that we're not a bunch of mysterious kooks running around in robes, calling down forces from the planet Mars to solve cases. At this particular time, there are about 18 of us in the metropolitan St. Louis area, and there are approximately 25 more around the country who have been trained by me. Each member of the squad brings his own specialty to the art of solving crime. People like Phyllis Degendorf, a graduate student of nearby George Washington University. She claims that by meditating, she can relive the moment of the crime. I tune in very quickly to pain. I start getting feelings whenever I'm holding an object. Then it will develop into mental pictures. I still don't pick up death. Uh, Lillian, does the chart say death to you? Yeah. It says death. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Betty, did they ever find out uh, what cult or what semi-religious Indian group was associated with this case. Judith Krauss uses a technique called psychometry. Okay, I started it, started two times. Okay. A housewife and mother, she claims that by holding an object belonging to the victim, she can identify with his experience. I learned to note down all my feelings that I get when I am holding something that belonged to a victim, because a lot of times those will be a clue. They feel it may be even... Judith and her husband, Bob, have been members of the squad for two years. Uh, this kind of thing, the National Star is looking into that, and they're going to let us know, yes. Bob Krause feels his unique skill is the ability to pinpoint the location of a crime. Bob is a music teacher at a local high school. He says that he has learned how to overcome the barriers of time and space and actually project himself to the scene of a crime. I feel, if any, that my forte would be in visualizing an area where something might have taken place. She would like to start with the map. Jim Miller, how about you? Okay. That's uh, the Acapulco area. Jim Mueller was the first to join Bevy Yeager. His special aptitude is locating kidnap victims. During the day, Jim is a social worker for the city of St. Louis. A psychic will sometimes, in addition to having mental impressions, may have body feelings of, of pain or distress that could reflect symptoms of the injured person. Is anyone aware yet of any particular wounds or abrasions or anything on the body or where they're located? Almost any police force will tell you when they can't come up with the answer, they don't mind where the answer comes from. And if it comes from us, fine. We are at least a licensed, reputable group of people. We're not just, you know, some odd kook out on the street. I'm trying to pick up purely from the picture of the woman herself. Okay. Eighteen specialists. Each uses a unique psychic skill to unravel a crime. At present, the squad is concentrating on the case of a travel agent who disappeared while vacationing in Mexico. And then they, they told us that they thought they had... Bevy envisions that in the near future, psychics will work with law enforcement on a broad and practical scale. 
her dream may not be so far-fetched. In only a few short years, Bevy herself has emerged from obscurity to become a detective with a solid reputation. It all began in 1971. Bevy's work in crime detection was triggered by the baffling case of a missing housewife. I think we ought to get down there if we can. Well, let's do it. Fine. Let's go. Bevy would take up the search with her psychic sensitivity. In 1971, the St. Louis police were baffled by the case of a missing woman named Sally Lucas. Known by her friends as a loving wife and devoted mother, she vanished from her comfortable suburban home without a trace. Every year, close to 80,000 people disappear, seemingly without motive. Sally Lucas was a classic example. Mrs. Lucas had last been seen leaving the town and country shopping center with an armful of packages. Detectives spent frustrating hours piecing together her last day. They suspected foul play. Police had scoured St. Louis, but could find no clues to her whereabouts. Three weeks from the day that Sally Lucas disappeared, Bevy Yeagers contacted the St. Louis Globe Democrat, one of the city's leading newspapers. She had a hunch. Bill Fustel, the city editor, remembers her call well. So, uh, police were at a dead end. Uh, there have been no evidence turned up. I'm not sure psychics are always accurate, but I do think that there is some something to this. She uh, touched some garments and a powder puff of the missing woman. And she said at that time that she described the woman whom she did not know, previously know. She described her fairly accurately, short hair, short of stature, didn't smoke much. And she said she got a, uh, a picture of some policemen bending over the car near a large body of water. The next day, her car was, Mrs. Lucas' car was found on the Gulf of Mexico. I called uh, Lieutenant Kariakis, and I said, I want to do something unusual, if we can do it. And he said, what? And I said, I want to bring the psychic out and let her sit in this car and see what kind of impressions she obtains. Lieutenant Kiriakis has been with the St. Louis police for 18 years. The veteran detective was taken aback that Fustel wanted to bring a psychic into the case. Well, my real feeling was that he's got to be kidding or he's putting me on just a little bit. Uh, I really uh, didn't think he was honestly serious at the time, but he was. But Mrs. Yeager asked if she could sit in the car. I kind of sat back and I thought, boy, this is really going to be something else. I'll be surprised if anything comes out of this. Psychics claim to be able to receive vivid impressions through the sense of touch. Sitting behind the wheel of the Lucas car, as Bevy demonstrated for us, a whole series of visual images flooded through her mind. She appeared to be lost in a deep trance. She sat in the car with a pad and a pen uh, for about 10 minutes, and she wrote down many things on that, on that paper. And at one point, about six minutes into the time she was in the car, she, uh, she got a terrible look of agony on her face, of pain. She began to sweat very heavily. The car gave off strong psychic vibrations. At first, the disconnected pictures that Bevy said flashed through her mind made no sense at all. My notes were full of, of letter C's and things like that. Horses heads. There was also a small bridge. Not a large bridge. And uh, there were some pillar-type mailboxes, the kind you find out in the country. I was leaning forward to either put the key in the lock or pull it out of. And as I did that, I was struck a very, very severe blow on the right side of the head. When I, I was out of the car, they handed me her car keys. And at that time, it broke me up completely. I couldn't go on with it at all, because I then realized from holding her keys that 
She had not been dead when she was taken out of the car and flung into the ditch. She was still alive. I think one of her first comments was that she felt an intense pain to the right side of her head. And uh, then the other impression was uh, water and a bridge and an airport. And then one of the last impressions was that of a horse or something to do with a horse. The clarity of Bevy's vision compelled her to personally take up the search. She reasoned that the best place to begin was the locale that most closely matched her psychic impressions. Bevy began to search the 10 square mile area of Babbler State Park, just northwest of St. Louis. She was accompanied by her husband, Ray, and psychic student, Jim Mueller. At first, the idea of penetrating such a vast and wild tract of land seemed hopeless. Hey, Ray. Hey, Jim, come here a minute. I feel some kind of pull out in that direction. Not right here, but like way over, what, down there. Can we get there from here? Yes, yes, roundabout, but we can get there. Well, okay. Well, well, I think that's right. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. An inexplicable force inside Bevy's body seemed to pull her in a definite direction. She had no idea what she would discover in the thick underbrush of Babbler State Park. As Bevy, Ray, and Jim followed the psychic trail, they began to notice significant clues that corroborated the mental images Bevy had received in Sally Lucas' car. A small airport called the Spirit of St. Louis was less than two miles away. The Babbler riding stables. Then the road sign, Wild Horse Creek, intersecting Highway C. Could this have been the C that kept appearing in Bevy's notes? A row of pillar mailboxes confirmed that she was heading in the right direction. And then, the final clue, one that came chillingly close to her psychic vision. Now there's a bridge up ahead. Maybe that's the place we ought to stop, but the creek looks like it's crossing the road. Just pull on past the bridge. Maybe, maybe we ought to look this place over here. My notes were full of, of letter C's and things like that, horses' heads. There was also a small bridge, and there were some pillar-type mailboxes, the kind you find out in the country. So finally, we stopped the car and we got out, and we decided that this area looked so right, we might as well just look a little closer. The terrain just looked right. It felt right. We started to tramp around a little bit. I can't explain that exactly, but there was a feeling in, in the body somewhere that there, there was something, and it, it was not far. It, it was almost as if my body was a, um, a magnetic needle, and it was seeking. It was honing in on a certain direction. The date was September 4th, 1971. They searched until the light became too dim to see any longer. Bevy was sure she was within a hair's breadth of finding the body and planned to return to the site the next morning. But the following day, a torrential rainstorm hit St. Louis 
and prevented Bevy from continuing her search. Two days later, Mrs. Lucas' body was washed out of a gully in Wild Horse Creek. The body was less than 150 feet from where Bevy Yeagers had been searching. Well, it was all about a day or two after we had found the body and had processed the scene and everything like that. And it came to me right there. I said, my God, everything she told us on that day in the car before we found Mrs. Lucas came true. The horse, which was Wild Horse Creek Road, the airport, which was close by, the water and the bridge. And also, on the right side of her head, the skull was crushed. And these were not things she could have known anyway. I have no way of accounting for it in any phase, any way. Uh, it was just a total mystery to me how she could be that accurate. What inexplicable force was it that compelled Bevy to search the ravines of Wild Horse Creek? Sandy uh, Franzak is an American girl from our city who was with a group of travel agents going down to Acapulco. Bevy and the Psychic Rescue Squad are continuing their casework on a national level. They feel they are moving closer to solving the case of the missing travel agent. Uh, yes, uh, in their search of the beach that they feel is Sandy's, but it hasn't been 100% identified by her roommate as having been what she had on when she left. It is not inconceivable that the role of the psychic detective could have major consequences for law enforcement in the United States. If the technique of using ESP to pinpoint crime and ferret out criminals can be developed on a broad and practical scale, it may become a deterrent to anyone contemplating a criminal act. This, it seems, may not be beyond the power of the mind.